Awesome. So welcome everyone to our Meet the Producer webinar this week. Um, thanks for everyone for chiming in at our new time of 9 a.m. Um, I think it's maybe a little bit tougher on Amon, but a little bit easier no. for us here on the West Coast. So Amon, thank you for coming. I know it's, it's getting to be late in the afternoon in Ethiopia. Yes, uh, 7 p.m., no problem. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and you know, just before we get started, just to let everybody know, these, um, these free webinars that we're hosting every Monday, um, we're really excited about. And they're part of kind of a larger educational programming that we've launched here with um, a combination of these free informational sessions, but also paid um, kind of more traditional Boot Coffee Campus training, um, just taken online. So we have some sessions that are um, ongoing that will we'll have more date, dates announced um, probably later today or tomorrow in coffee roasting business and also elements of profiling. And at the end of the week, we'll have a scoring with the SCA cupping form session. So a little plug for those before we get rolling here. Nice. Um, but um, you know, today's guests, I wanted to invite both Aman and Patrick to come on board and talk a little bit about their businesses, um, Metad in Ethiopia and Finca Mahuwal in El Salvador. And you know, it's, it's a pretty open-ended discussion. Each has sent me some really nice talking points, which I've built into the presentation to kind of guide this session. But um, you know, really, I hope that this can be more conversational. And I encourage um, any of our attendees to please um, use the chat window if you have questions that you'd like to ask, and we'll do our best to incorporate them. And we'll also have some discussion time um, at the end. And, you know, specifically, I'm really interested in hearing, um, you know, from Aman and Patrick about, um, you know, some specifics of their business, a little bit of an overview of who they are. Um, I think everybody's curious to hear more about what the world of COVID-19 means in your businesses and on your farms and in your countries with supply chains and access to product coming out. Um, but also, I think, you know, to keep it, um, you know, kind of forward looking as well. I'm always curious because you both produce some of the, my favorite coffees to hear, you know, what's your secret sauce? What's, what, what do you feel like sharing about the secret ingredient that makes your coffee so special? Um, and I think incorporated with that, our listeners are always quite interested and keen to hear about some of your sustainability efforts, which I know both of you shared some, some material with that. So um, first of all, I just am going to ask each of our presenters to just introduce themselves briefly. I'm on first and then um, Patrick, and then we'll um, go into kind of a, a little brief on both of them. So Amon, why don't you take it away? I summarized your extensive biography. I hope you don't mind. It's good, in fact. <laughs> I can read it. I can read it now. Um, no, um, this is Amon. I don't know. Uh, I know most of you, uh, at least uh, after living in the U.S., for about uh, 26 years. I have always been in the corporate world, uh, worked for 3M uh, Northwest and DHL, as you can see. Later on, I was uh, recruited by UNDP and seconded to the Ethiopia Commodity Exchange. I'm the founding CEO, Chief Operations Officer of the exchange. Don't blame me. <laughs> we have a lot, we've had a lot of problems uh, when we started out. I think uh, some of the kinks are out. Uh, but after working, uh, wh while I was working there, because I never thought I would be in a coffee business or a coffee in the, in the coffee industry, but uh, working at the exchange really opened up my eyes. Uh, uh, I saw a lot of a huge gap in the coffee industry, especially in the specialty coffee industry. So uh, I knew when my gig was up, uh, I would be in a coffee business for two reasons. One, as, as I said, the gap was huge. Um, uh, you see great growers, great exporters, uh, processors, uh, uh, restaurant or cafe owners or roasters, but none of them are uh, participating in the entire value chain. There were only two companies at that time who were doing, uh, uh, participating in the entire value chain. That's one thing I wanted to see. Second thing is I really envisioned uh, a new specialty coffee industry uh, for Ethiopia, where uh, 
we give back to the people and still uh, flourish and uh, uh, process the highest quality coffee uh, and uh, to the consumers around the world. That's, that's the premise, that's the, uh, the vision. Uh, giving back to the community is a number one thing for me, uh, it's personal. I had a health care in, uh, in 2004 and uh, I thought at that time, uh, or I realized uh, I've done a great job for myself and my family, but nothing for my countrymen. So I thought uh, giving back to the community uh, one of, uh, because of the travel I, I made for ECX, setting up uh, operations around Ethiopia. Uh, I thought uh, doing it outside of Addis, uh, out in the boonies and uh, in the coffee industry, uh, uh, I, uh, we could help a lot of people. And I think That's we great. achieved that. Yeah, thanks, Amon. I'm, I'm anxious to get into some more details of that um, once we get into some of the slides that you shared. Yeah. But um, Patrick, let's hand it over to you to, a little bit to give some of your background. Also, you come from kind of a corporate background. So interesting alignment there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Marcus and uh, well, Willem, everyone else, glad to be here. Um, my name is Patrick Murray. As my very brief bio says, I'm a fourth generation uh, specialty coffee producer. Um, but um, I'm actually glad that that's all it says, because as of right now, that's, that's what I consider myself, man. I think what you've done in the past, it certainly determines to a degree what you're doing in the present and you might do in the future. Um, but I also come from a, um, let's say corporate background, you know, four, four walls and a computer screen with AC all day. Um, and that's something that uh, sharing with Aman's perspective, um, being in that world uh, made me feel a bit powerless. You know, I knew that I could do so much more for so many more people um, through coffee. And that's what motivated me to um, sort of leave that corporate world behind, that, that uh, steady and, and secure salary and uh, come into a world of coffee um, where, of course, there was a lot of risk involved in, in taking the reins of an operation that's been around since 1936, but that has never been directly managed by our family. So I am, in fact, a fourth generation um, you know, property owner, but not necessarily a producer because of the prior generations. I'm, I'm pretty much a first generation uh, producer. Um, it's been five years now since I left the, the banking, uh, the financial industry here in El Salvador. And uh, it's been a wonderful five years of learning, of uh, challenges, of meeting great people, of working with uh, very talented individuals and very passionate um, companies. And um, I've found that this is a two-way conversation. You know, as long as coffee at origin um, remains transparent, remains ethical, and is able to communicate that to the outside world, a lot of good can be done and coffee can be turned into that development tool that countries like El Salvador uh, need so much. Um, coffee has sort of taken a roller coaster ride in El Salvador over the last century, uh, going from being the, the main cash crop of the country and now uh, being uh, on, on, on sort of a, an intensive care unit on a lifeline. Um, but there's a new generation of producers, which I'm part, proudly a part of. Um, we're all sort of trying to work together, um, not like our past generations where everyone was compartmentalized and doing their own thing. Uh, we've understood that the value chain has to work together. So it's not just producers working with producers. It's producers working with millers, exporters, roasters, even coffee shops locally uh, to, to make coffee great again um, and, and, you know, make coffee in El Salvador something that is an attractive uh, business and, and not a, uh, a um, you know, a, a burden for those who work in, in this uh, industry. So I'm glad to share with you all, all of our 
um, ins and outs. And uh, in terms of secret sauce, I think uh, also sharing with, with Aman, I think that uh, the secret sauce is, is the people, you know, if the people are happy, if the people are well paid, if the people are healthy, um, and when I say people, I mean everyone from those who come and collaborate during uh, the harvest season for picking uh, up to the barista behind the counter in the coffee shop. You know, if, if everyone is doing well uh, in, in, in e not equal terms of, 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 of income or pay, but if, if relative terms apply uh, and everyone is doing well, I think this is uh, uh, an industry that can do a lot of good for the world and, and everyone involved in it. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you. And it's, you know, I, I was so excited to invite both of you on this because when I think about, you know, folks that have kind of returned home, um, decided to make this investment in the communities where their families and their, their histories <clears throat> are from, um, I, I always think of both Ethiopia and El Salvador. I think, um, you know, it's, well, you two are both quite unique in what you've accomplished. Um, I can point to other people in both of your countries kind of at a, at a level higher than maybe some other places um, that are producing countries that, um, mm -hmm. with folks that have kind of made that commitment to return back home. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you both. And um, you. I'm excited to hear just a little bit about, you know, Metad and we can kind of move as quickly or as slowly as you like through the salon, these are the dozen slides or whatever that you shared. Um, we already had this information on your intro, so um, I think it's nice just to get a little summary of who you are. And good thing we've got an intelligentsia bag there with Jeff on the call. Good job. Exactly. <laughs> last last minute. I, no, I'm just kidding. It's always there. <laughs> always there uh, because uh, we could not be where we are without having uh, great partners like Intelligentsia and specifically mm -hmm. Jeff. Um, our secret uh, sources are again, uh, what uh, Patrick just said, uh, the people we have, the employees, staff, and the outgrowers. And we work with uh, over 6,800 outgrowers. And that means we're supporting uh, over 65,000 households. So that's, that's what I was talking about, giving back uh, at a high level. Uh, if you guys travel to Addis, you know, the best investment to be in is construction, <laughs> not coffee 470 kilometers out with all that terrible road and everything, or with all the tribal bickering and everything that we go through. But I would do it over and over again because there's, no such, there's nothing that makes me happy than seeing the community happy and flourish with us. I mean, we're growing together. And in that, uh, in that formula, always your partners, you know, like, like Intelligentsia, Blue Bottle, Pitts, uh, Royal Coffee, uh, to name a few. I mean, uh, from small uh, rosters to um, major ones. I mean, I cannot name them all. But that special relationship with them uh, it's not just hiring the best agronomist, but all these people like Jeff, uh, they have um, uh, 20 plus year experience in coffee. They, they learn around the world and sharing it selflessly. I mean, the, no, I mean, uh, Jeff can tell you, he stayed with us in, in a tent when we started out. <laughs> so that's how, that's how we started. He knows how we began. Uh, we didn't have this fancy uh, 22, room bangalows that we have now. No, no hot shower uh, when we started out. We regularly forgot he, he was a, a vegetarian too. <laughs> he, was, he was starving <laughs> when we brought uh, meat-related products. But what I mean is uh, that's the secret. And uh, uh, getting the best varieties for your own farms. We have four varieties that uh, uh, even though they have their own numbers, they are named uh, after my uh, parents and, uh, and the grandparents. Uh, that's how we market them. And uh, we participate in uh, 14, um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just talking, you know that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. And that, I think, you that, know, that I'm just kind of, I, I've got a copy of your presentation <laughs> pulled up here, so I kind of know what's coming. Okay. So that, that's okay. fine, I think. Um, so the, the way we started out, it's in, uh, 
even though we are registered in 2012, uh, we didn't get the land until uh, later, uh, October or late September 2013. So past the, the uh, planting uh, season. So immediately uh, I have decided uh, to start recruiting outgrowers. So we had 480 outgrowers initially. Now we have 6,800, uh, as I said. And at, at the time, in fact, um, the government didn't allow you or prevent you from having outgrowers. It's a gray line. We chose to take a chance, and I'm glad we, we took a chance for this reason. Because once they saw us doing a good job uh, in Hambella, we were recruited and given a contract uh, to get into uh, to train outgrowth. This is an AGP program. Uh, uh, it's a combination of uh, Ministry of Agriculture and USAID. So that legitimized <laughs> my dad's outgrowth program <laughs> in a way. In fact, you know, whenever I talk to Coffee and Tea Authority now, they say, Aman, you're too big to <laughs> dismantle. We, we decided to join you. So there is a, an amazing uh, uh, story at the end, you know, they, they have uh, by uh, proclamation, you, you have this outdoor system or, outdoor or contract farming, they call it in some cases, uh, is legal in Ethiopia, which is wow. great. And yeah, a and lot that, of them are doing, yeah. And that public-private partnership, really, I mean, it's, as you sort of say, it's become a model. And, you know, if we look at exactly. the, the end of this slide with where you've come and the famous exactly. Good Food Awards of 2018 is <laughs> something worth celebrating. I mean, <laughs> exactly. exactly. So you were in the right place at the right time. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, so uh, um, again, we uh, focus uh, on uh, uh, specialty coffee, and that's intentional from day one. Uh, when I started out, uh, uh, in fact, when I was at uh, ECX, the last year of my ECX, when we were giving out our business card, every buyer was, was going to say, what is my dad? What do you do? We know you from ECX, Aman. What are you doing? Uh, we, do you think Ethiopia needs another exporter? <laughs> you know, this is kind of discouraging initially, by the way. Uh, yeah. But um, the relationship uh, I had with the CQI, for example, uh, was lingual, you know, David, uh, ACA, Rick Reinhardt, uh, because of my position, I was the COO of uh, the exchange. Uh, I asked them, I want to certify a lab. And uh, can you send me, show me or uh, direct me to an Ethiopian lab that I can copy? <laughs> and they said, what are you talking about? There was no even a single lab in Africa that certified, not let alone Ethiopia. So that's bingo. You know, that's, that's one thing really helped us, really. So we, your lab has helped us, of course, Aman. Both Willem and I have enjoyed exactly. and been appreciative of access to your lab at various times Thank you. over the years because it is a beautiful Thank you. facility. All of you used it, and it's a great promotion. But um, by certifying that lab, uh, uh, we were published on 480 uh, newspaper or magazines or blogs, whatever, around the world. So that uh, Matad name is associated with specialty coffee. Uh, and then uh, initially, uh, immediately, the first year we did only sun dried, which uh, Jeff <laughs> doesn't like, <laughs> didn't buy, <laughs> even though he was at the farm with us. Uh, so, but we invested in uh, eco-friendly uh, machines so that we don't waste water. Uh, we, invest, uh, we brought in from uh, uh, Colombia, you know, Penagos machines. That helped a great deal. Um, um, so it's not only a, a pro, it's fast, efficient, uh, you know, you save water, it's eco-friendly, but even the buyers, our buyers, um, I, because I was afraid, you know, maybe they're used to this seven day, whatever, to 72 hours, 48 hours uh, fermentation uh, process that the, the traditional Ethiopian uh, washing stations have, but uh, the encouragement I got from all of them, you know, all of our buyers was to go for it, get the 
eco-friendly machines and uh, it hasn't let us down. Right, and I love um, that idea of like learning from others in the industry, right? I mean, be exa the, exactly. what your buyers are requesting or understanding what's happening elsewhere in Exactly. I mean, in the there area. is no, exactly. Yep. Um, yeah. Like, uh, and we do have a question can... here just about your lab that, um, that I think okay. I might be able to answer as well as you can, Amon. But um, okay. Ruth Ann Church has asked if your lab really is the first in East Africa, because she and I are both very familiar with the beautiful Starbucks lab in Kigali, um, which is yeah. not a, an officially certified lab, even though it's a well outfitted and perfectly functional lab. But having that that certification, Ruth Ann, is what allows Amon's lab to host exactly. things like um, Q grade trainings um, in, exactly. in Ethiopia, which hasn't happened in that lab in Kigali. So now there is a certified lab in Rwanda um, with the company I used to work for with Sustainable Harvest. But for many, many years, you were the one, Amon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> pioneer. The, the, the key is uh, certified by SCA. I mean, labs, there are so many labs in Ethiopia, as you know. I mean, yep. Yeah. But are they at that standard, at that level? Are they certified? No. Uh, ours was certified on Friday. ECX was certified on Sunday. So we started saying we are the first privately certified lab in Africa. <laughs> they say the publicly certified lab. So I'm happy to report. I mean, our second lab is certified again you know, last December. It's uh, certified for larger people, for 24 students. And this is uh, at the new facility, which I have some... New facility some yeah. renderings of here. There we go. <laughs> um, wow. Jeff had a chance to cup, uh, Willem just passed through it. Uh, it can host uh, 30 to 40 people for cupping, but for training, we're certified for 24 uh, students. Wow. So we're, both labs are op uh, operational. We, we didn't close the first one either. Okay. So wow, we can go that's back beautiful. to- Yeah, I think it's, um, it, I'm excited to see this lab because the old lab was so so beautiful and functional and Thank you. I'm sure with more room. Um, oh yeah, this, this is larger and bigger. Yep. <laughs> I mean, larger and better, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, Jeff can talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about your corporate social responsibility and kind of your commitments to sustain it. Oh, I think Patrick has a question as well. Yeah, sorry, Marcus. Before we we continue, Aman, this is uh, really interesting on on my end as a producer um, to to see where Metad has gotten and and where you've taken it and where you're certainly going to take it further. But how did you transit? Did you go all in when you started this, or how did you transition um, from going? from producing coffee to exporting to now having such a, a strong hold in the, the quality aspect of, of coffee in Ethiopia, not only in, in Ethiopia, but in East Africa, you know, how, how do you, was that sort of from the get go, did you want to become the reference point for quality or, or did that just come out of, of, um, you know, the woodwork as, as things developed? I mean, uh, the, the short answer is that's the vision I had. Uh, you, I, I am in Ethiopia. Ethiopia has wonderful coffees around, <laughs> all over. So you have to be the best. So that's number one. I mean, we want it to be the best. We want it to be the standard barrier in okay. a special category. That's number one. Second thing is, uh, we don't say we're great and then we don't, we don't lay back. Every mm -hmm. year, every time we want to be the best, we strive to be the best and to improve. So I don't know how many times I waste <laughs> Jeff's time or, uh, or our partners. What can we do? How do we process? Uh, what do we need to do differently to win? And the other thing is my mindset is to be the best in the world, not, not in Africa, not in Ethiopia. So I have to, I have to look at other um, places. What are they doing differently? We're yeah. blessed with amazing coffees, guys. I can't, I can't take credit for having amazing coffees. But if you don't process them right, you know, you can ruin them. You know that. Uh, if yeah. we don't market them, market them right, what does them uh, do if you have a Mercedes in a, in a garage? 
okay? Yeah. If you don't take care of the people, there's no sustainability. That's why we- yeah. I, uh, I ask because, yeah. sorry, yeah. <laughs> I ask because a lot of people think that coffee just grows on trees and that excellent mm -hmm. coffee is just, you know, just happens. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that one of the, one of my favorite phrases um, is that great coffee doesn't just happen. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work behind it and there's well, people like yourself that have a vision and you stick to that vision and it's year on year, you set out yeah. to actually do your best. So, that's something I respect a lot with uh, with your coffees and, and other people that that are doing uh, sort of the same thing and aspiring to, to the same goals. Thank you, thank you. I mean, uh, that's the only way to do it. I mean, if you, I, you don't go to business or anything to be number two, number three, number four, number ten, and be happy or settled. <laughs> I I don't want to drive 470 kilometers out of Addis, or why would I even live in Addis? I'm a U.S. citizen. I have a home in, in the US. I don't need to be in Ethiopia. I, I have to make a change. I have to make an impact. And I think we have done it. As I said, we have uh, 6,800 outgrowers. Uh, not only we train them on pre and post harvesting uh, every year, uh, we provide seedlings. We have given out over 600,000 seedlings to, for free to these outgrowers. What the reason we're doing that is one, so they can expand their footprint. You know, they have hectare, a uh, couple of hectares, but they have maybe a quarter of a hectare of a uh, tree. The other thing is we want them to uproot the old uh, 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 trees and replace them with CBD resistant uh, seedlings. That's another one. And they would high yielding uh, uh, seedlings. So the training is going to help them, uh, as we have been helping them, to uh, improve their yield and improve quality. And the training uh, with, you know, whether it's uh, weeding, pruning, anything related uh, and uh, pre-harvesting, and then uh, post-harvesting, they used to just uh, pick every coffee, green, yellow, and uh, red. Uh, I always tell them uh, green, yellow, and red is only for our flag. <laughs> not for co coffee, <laughs> just, <laughs> just pick, pick only red, red cherries. So in due time, I mean, they're giving us amazing coffee. That's another secret because we pick only red cherries. And if they, if they don't pick, they get punished in a way because we pick and they return. They go back and sell it to another washing station. Okay. So uh, the other thing is as far as corporate uh, responsibility, uh, initially, before even we sold the single bean uh, to uh, exported single bean, uh, we adopted an elementary school that the kids you see on, on the screen. Uh, they used to be around 400 something at that time. Now they're 800 plus. With Gadev, we have about 1,500 elementary school students we supported. Our focus is education. Um, and then we support 105 disadvantaged university students go to university in Dilla. And 80% of them are uh, medical doctors. So if they save one person, I'm a happy camper. Uh, that the other thing we do, and we built community centers in uh, Bishanfugu. Uh, women used to sit under a tree for a family planning meeting. No, they don't do that anymore. That community center holds 1,000 people. Mm. Uh, we use it for, to train our outgrowers at the same time. Uh, we built roads so that people can inter interlink with, uh, you know, uh, with other regions so they can sell their uh, other goods. Uh, now, this year, we're, uh, we're focusing on uh, introducing uh, apiculture. So we're buying lots of uh, beehives. So coffee is an amazing uh, place to start. You know, the same land, same area, same people managing uh, bee, uh, beehives in apiculture. They can have wax and honey for export. That's additional stream of income. Another one we want to introduce is spices. That's going to happen next year. Uh, because of, uh, there are a lot of conflicts, as you know, which have been between Guji and uh, Gedio. So we couldn't implement all these things that we wanted to do three, four years ago. Now things have settled down 
uh, we're going to be uh, introducing those. Wow, it's going to help them a lot. Yeah. Um, so Naman, before we, um, we hand the baton over to Patrick to talk about Pinka Mahawal, any sort of parting thoughts or last statements you want to make about Hambella before, before we wrap up talking no, about uh, Ated? No, 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 come visit. <laughs> it's very <laughs> difficult. It's very easy to talk about uh, about Matad. I can't stop. I, you can give me five hours. I can talk about um, uh, Hambala and. Uh, uh, but the only thing, the last thing I would say is again, thank you to our partners. You know, like in Telenisha, uh, they made a huge effort in promoting us around the world. We became one of the strategy, by the way, um, uh, if I may. Uh, say, you know, working with intelligence, Blue Bottle, uh, and, you know, these big names, people, other rosters started to notice Matad. If Jeff picked Matad, you know, they know he's not going to just pick because the cupping is good or it's a good coffee or uh, I, uh, I look uh, fashionable. <laughs> That's not the case. He travels, he sleeps with you in, in, in a tent, as I said. Uh, meets with the community, uh, outgrowers and all that. So small buyers that they don't have rosters, they don't have the resources to travel to origins. They trust uh, uh, a judgment of people like Jeff and uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, other you know well-known buyers. That gave us an upper hand, by the way. So that's how we grew. That's another secret. Uh, as I said, you can have a Mercedes, but somebody <laughs> needs to go out and drive it around. So the, you have a Mercedes, you know. <laughs> our, our drivers are the uh, rosters. So I want to thank them. Uh, Royal awesome. Coffee, at the same time, Royal Coffee, they did an amazing job marketing Hambala. Perfect. The Hambala so, name became big. Thank so you. if a roaster is listening to this um, and they're interested in getting their hands on your coffee, they should check out Royal Coffee. Excellent. That, okay, Great perfect. Idea. We'll give a little plug to you there, Aman. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, I'll, um, I'll hand this over to Patrick. Um, for his presentation, I pulled a few photos off of the awesome Finca Mahuwal Instagram feed, um, as well as some that he shared with me. So um, I will go ahead and unmute you, or you can unmute yourself and we're good to go, Patrick. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Aman. That was a, a great um, presentation. Um, I, I, again, uh, think that you are, in, in our case, one of the, the, um, the models or examples that, that we certainly respect and aspire to, uh, because you, you've come um, a bit of a longer way than we have. But um, at Finca Mahawal, we are strictly focused on producing coffee here in El Salvador. Um, and in our case is a bit different in that um, we've been a, a family owned operation, as I said, since 1936. Um, and our focus has always been, as you can see in the, um, in the, in, in our logo on the screen, um, our focus and our mission and our philosophy has always been coffee growing people. You know, this is obviously a play on words um, because we are people that grow coffee, but it's also our mission to have the coffee grow our people. Uh, and when I say our people, I don't mean just the people that work uh, and collaborate with Finca Mahawal. I mean uh, El Salvador in general. You know, we want to be that guiding light um, for other producers uh, locally to understand the value of coffee um, and its impact on people, on the environment, and on society as a whole. And so that's, that's sort of our, our, our background. That's sort of what, what drives us. Um, and in our case, specifically talking a bit about um, what we do, how we do, and why we do it, uh, and how that's sort of uh, been challenged by uh, the, the current crisis, um, it's, been, it's been tough, you know, because a lot of people um, or, or other companies might think that um, the, the social impact or the corporate social responsibility, however you want to call it, um, is probably the first thing that should go 
when you're cutting costs or when you're, you know, sort of cutting the fat uh, in your operation. Uh, but in our case, we are not at all trying to, to do away with our social impact uh, because of the value it holds in our operation. You know, that's what we're about. Uh, so during this crisis, we've had to, to get creative, uh, reconfigure our operation, you know, uh, being very creative in, in, in our budgeting and our, in our availability, our, our, our cash flow uh, to run our operation. Uh, because as you know, with any agricultural uh, project or operation, it's not like you just turn off the switch and in a month you can turn it back on and the machine is up and running again. If you don't do certain things in a certain time because of rainfall, because of uh, flowering, because of uh, different stages in the, in the coffee cherry development, you simply just can't, if you didn't do it last week, you can't do it next week. Uh, so there are certain um, adventurous and, and uh, risky challenges we have uh, undertaken, but we're confident that regardless of this crisis, uh, we're going to be able to produce some excellent coffees for next harvest. Um, by saying that, I also wanted to refer to, to the, um, the, how this crisis, you know, we're all, the whole world is facing this, this uncertain, weird time. So it's not something that's exclusive to El Salvador or exclusive to Finca Mahawal. So obviously, some buyers, in our case, where we've had relationships for a couple of years, have simply opted to not buy our coffee anymore. So that pushes our, uh, our availability to, to get creative and use uh, social media or other channels to promote our coffees and to, to, um, to get other people interested in buying uh, these coffees that you know, we can't just sit on for another year because of the quality they hold. Uh, so that on one end has, has been a challenge for us. Uh, and on the other end, locally, we've, uh, we've been sort of forced into uh, commercializing our coffee locally. Uh, one of the positive things that I think will come from this crisis in a country like El Salvador is that producers are now understanding and seeing the value of the local consumer market. Uh, people are not going to stop drinking coffee uh, locally. Um, and uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for operations and coffees like Finca Mahawal to present itself to the local consumer market. Uh, so we've seen, we, we started literally selling our roasted coffee locally about a week ago. Um, and we're looking to, to be competitive, you know. We're not offering our coffees for, you know, this specialty high-end um, market here in El Salvador. Obviously, the, the purchasing power here is, is, is lower than you would have in New York or Berlin or Tokyo. Um, but this is a strategy that's going to allow us to have cash flow to run our operation locally. Uh, because, of course, if we have coffees that are on sale uh, with buyers, you know, that money, that, that the financing for those coffees is going to come once the coffees get to uh, their destination. So there's, there's obviously a, um, a bit of a, a disjuncture in, in the cash flow situation in coffee because of its seasonality. Uh, but again, those are things we are, we're learning to deal with and, and being pushed to our, our limits in this crisis uh, to get creative, to do our best and to do what we can with what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick, um, what, um, as, yep. as you've kind of worked on the budget for this, um, yeah. one of our listeners is, is, is messaging asking about, you know, what, what portion of your revenue do you think can come from roasted coffee? And Aman, I can ask the same question as you, because I see for 2020, your roasting brand is also um, one of the goals. So what, how do you, how do you Im imagine this impacting the, the cash flow in the bottom line? 
I think, it, well, in, in our particular case, this is uncharted territory for us. You know, we're literally, we, we've been out for a week, um, <laughs> but we've had a great response. Um, and in our projections, um, we are relying on this to be at least a half of our, uh, of, of what we can produce and, and, um, and commercialize locally. So this, this should be, if you know if all goes as planned and if the market has a, a good reception that for now it has it's been it's been wonderful um right. but if we can ma maintain that um that's certainly going to be something that that we're going to pay more attention to mm -hmm. yeah that's um those those kinds of projects are are dear to me having worked with question coffee of course and um in Rwanda, which was kind of a similar idea, was to take producers, smallholder coffees, and offer them to the local market. Maman, yeah. how how are you, kind of planning for the the impact on your bottom line from roasting? Roasting, uh, not so good because um, our plan was to start it this year. We were in a major discussion with uh, Chinese companies, uh, hotels in China, I, I, even though they're U.S. hotels. Mm -hmm. and uh, Macau and uh, Japanese uh, high-end resorts. Those are the ones who were asking us to roast initially and some in the uh, Middle East. But uh, as you, because of uh, COVID, I think that plan is shot. I don't see it uh, happening uh, this year, maybe 2021. Right. I'm uh, solely focused on our green coffee we prepared coffee based on requests, uh, mostly uh, plus five or ten percent more than uh, what our customers want. So far, I'm uh, not on woods. I mean, and I'm, we're the luckiest, uh, to be frank. Uh, all our partners have come through and uh, uh, ordered, uh, honored the contracts. So we're shipping as much as fast as we can. Uh, the main uh, problem we're seeing currently is uh, with shipping companies. You know, Jeff, you're lucky your coffee's uh, left <laughs> on, in time, but uh, some of the shipping companies, they're leaving uh, containers in Djibouti for uh, two, three, four weeks now. Uh, they're missing all the uh, scheduled uh, departure you know, uh, times, uh, days. So that's a um, major concern. We have over 16 containers sitting in Djibouti now. So wow. that's a major concern. Wow. Hopefully they will leave by uh, end of this week. At least we got an, uh, a confirmation today, hopefully. I mean, because they, they said they, would, they were gonna ship them last Monday and then Wednesday, it didn't happen. So uh, as you know, Djibouti is so hot. I'm just concerned we may do numbers mm -hmm. on our quality coffee, even though they're in Grey Pro. Uh, that's that's, that's uh, what's going on. But the roasted coffee, no, not this year. All right. Yeah, thanks for the update. I'm sorry to hear that, Amon. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but Patrick, we've, um, you know, this, this slide speaks to some of your sort of sustainability efforts, and it's something that I've always been so, you know, kind of moved by. I mean, of course, your tagline, coffee growing people. Um, but some of the actual um, procedures that you've implemented, if you can talk to some of those. Um, and I think, you know, how that, how you think that impacts the quality in the cup and of course, not just the quality of life of the producers, but. For sure. It, well, as you can see in the slide, the, we've been running a local clinic and a local school for about 50 years now, uh, since the late well, mid 60s, late 60s, um, where both of these, the, the clinic and the school were established. Um, and again, that's something that I've sort of come into. It, it's not my creation, but it's something we've certainly focused on a, a lot more than in the past. Um, it, these are two social responsibility projects that are devoted not only to those who work at Tinka Mahawal, but it, it, they're, they're open for the community at uh, Los Naranjos, where we where were established. Um, both of these projects have been sort of a, our standard. It, it's something that we've we've done, as I said, for for many years. 
Um, but the other element of our coffee growing people philosophy is uh, nutrition. Uh, so the three three pronged approaches: nutrition, education, and health. You know, nutrition through a nutritional program, which we provide food for for every single one of our collaborators during and out of harvest season. Um, that's obviously something that that uh, is attractive for people to work at Finca Mahawal, but it's also in our best interest for people to be well fed, to have, you know, their, their proper nutrition, because coffee is, is a hard job. Uh, it, it's not an easy task. Uh, picking coffee in, in very complicated uh, sloping terrain, and, and sometimes it's, it's very hot, in, in the, or the weather is, is, is you know, it's, it's an uncomfortable uh, feat. So if we can provide food for people to be, uh, you know, to, to meet their nutritional needs and to have them not focus on where they're going to get their food or, or how they're going to, uh, you know, dive into their pockets to go buy food, uh, that allows our collaborators to focus strictly on doing their best uh, possible job while picking the coffee or while sorting the coffee or while doing any of the activities during the off season. Um, so a lot of people might think that these are costs that we're just uh, picking up, but in reality, these are investments, uh, and as we like to call them, these are investments in humanity. You know, We're trying to make a difficult job easier uh, for those who do it and for those who are committed year on year uh, to, to collaborating with Finca Mahawal. Uh, so this is obviously a win-win a situation. Uh, we are guaranteeing that uh, most people will prefer to come work with us rather than the next guy that uh, doesn't have any of these benefits. Um, but also people have, you know, the, 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 um, the guarantee that they will be, that they will have food during the day that their families are gonna be uh, taken care of, that their kids can go to school and that there's a clinic just uh, available to them if they have any, any health issues. Um, one of the projects Marcus, that, that we're starting to work with this year and that is going to be a really, really a special is that we have a cooperative next door, literally next door to our operation. You know, same altitude, same soil, same microclimate, pretty much the same varieties uh, we have. So, uh, Bourbon, Paca, Pacamara. Um, and these guys have been completely in the dark for however long they've existed. You know, they work directly with a, a um, their, their local sort of board of directors and their local board of directors have the relationship with a certain mill and that mill has access to market. These people, the producers at this cooperative are making on average about at most a, 45 to 50 cents a pound. And you're talking about coffees being grown at 1600 meters above sea level with extraordinary microclimate, with extraordinary varieties. Um, and these are coffees that on, you know, if, if, if you compare to our prices, um, we're averaging around $3 a pound. Uh, so if you go from 45 cents to $3 a pound, it, that's quite a difference. Uh, what we're doing this year is, uh, and we've, we've already done it, we've um, already worked with eight of the, out of the 20 producers, um, is that we're leveraging our position to provide access to market for them. And uh, up to this point, we've managed to allocate some of their coffees for prices they've never even dreamt of. Uh, so uh, again, our, our, our element or, or our main driving philosophy of being coffee growing people isn't just self-serving for us. It's actually uh, transcending our property borders and, and bringing others along with us. Uh, because at the end, you know, it's in our best interest uh, to keep them productive. Their alternative is to chop down the coffee trees because they're, it's, it's just not sustainable for them. Uh, chop down the coffee trees and plant corn or plant other things. And the moment they do that, the microclimate's gonna change. And if the microclimate changes, 
we're going to be directly affected. So Finca Mahawal won't be able to produce the quality it's been able to produce in the past. So it's in our best interest to keep them productive. So that's, that's, an, you know, that's something people might see as an extra effort. We're not taking any commission on those coffees. We're just becoming that bridge between interested buyers or roasters that understand our philosophy and matching them with these extraordinary coffees that some of them, I must say, are even uh, cupping higher than some of the Mahawal coffees. Uh, ah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's really exciting to be able to do this for people that have no clue because no one's taken the time to, to educate them or inform them uh, of what they're sitting on. Yeah, so, so it's exciting for us. Uh, not to see them as competition, quite, quite uh, on the contrary. Uh, we want them to be successful because their success implies that we're going to be able to continue our operation in the future. Right. Yeah. No, I really love that. And um, I think, you know, as you're talking about some of your commitments to your, your staff and the other outgrowers and things that um, it, it is like, it's very collaborative. You know, I like even the, you know, the meal program, which as you said, that seems like an expense. It seems maybe a little bit um, out of the ordinary for some other producers, but it's, it's something that we've almost taken for granted here, um, kind of downstream on the supply chain where every tech company in the Bay Area or Chicago or New York feeds all their employees all the time, right? Yeah. They, they've sort of recognized the value proposition and uh, making sure that yeah. their folks are, are fed and healthy and that they're not having to like leave and return home or go out for a bite. Um, it's just exactly. more efficient. So yeah, to some degree, it makes your operation more efficient. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely something we get out of it. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, people doing anything on an empty stomach sucks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's just uh, for us, it's common sense to, to, if we're able to do it, uh, we know that in the long run, that's going to be something that, that's beneficial both for our collaborators and, and our operation. No, that's great. Thank you. And yeah. um, as, as we near the, um, the end of the session here, I just wanted to open it up to both of you if you have sort of any, any parting thoughts or questions for one another um, to, to wrap us up. Well, um, on my so behalf, I... I wanted to, uh, to um, again, uh, commend Aman and, and Metad, and I'm, I'm um, sad that I wasn't able to join the Ethiopia trip back a couple of years ago <laughs> with ECW, uh, with Intelligentsia, because of, in, in those times, it was the Ebola craze. Um, and now, again, the ECW was canceled this year, but we're looking forward to uh, joining Jeff you and and the rest of the of the ecw team um next year and um and again if if anyone wants to come around or wants to learn more about finca mahawal you can contact us directly through our instagram page or um go through boot who's uh who's you guys marcus and willem have been uh elemental ever since that bird song panama geisha trip um to having us understand a, you know how to take coffee to the next level yeah, so i'm i'm very glad that um that you guys are doing well that everyone else is doing well and i hope everyone stays safe and stays healthy yeah thank you um and yeah the power of ditto. collaboration i'm on <laughs> i said ditto uh patrick uh, you guys are doing an amazing job hopefully uh, i will have a chance uh, to travel to el salvador and check out your uh, farm and uh, operations and uh, meet with your people. Um, that's, that was the goal this year. Uh, we had a uh, plan to travel to Colombia uh, to do the same. You know, I was gonna bring uh, our agronomists, our quality folks and one, uh, uh, one uh, lead farmer from each site and uh, a couple of government uh, DAs or uh, 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 you know, um, um, managers, whatever they choose, but they have to have background in uh, in uh, coffee agronomy. Uh, the idea was 
to share uh, our uh, you know uh, experiences uh, to learn from one another but uh, that's not happening uh, as you know that's the sad part but the beautiful thing about uh, our industry is this you know we share we don't uh, keep anything we don't hold back we give anything and any one of you or anybody wants to visit uh, our sites or farms or processing plants uh, you're welcome. We have uh, seven, uh, it's going to go about eight processing sites in uh, Ambala and Gade. Uh, we have uh, uh, 20,000 plus capacity in wash, per hour capacity washing machines and washing machines, uh, weight mills, and uh, 9,000 plus per hour uh, dry mills at the farm. The yeah. new processing plant in Addis is a Cambria machine, it's 10, 10 ton per hour capacity. And the warehouse is uh, on 6,400, uh, 6,440 square meter. So it's a large operation. And Amazing. I'm, I'm glad Jeff and uh, Willem visited it. And um, we're <laughs> very proud of it, but we can't uh, showcase what we have accomplished because of this uh, virus, you know, this uh, pandemic. Yeah. It's not the, the time to talk about that. Yeah, no, thank uh, you, Aman. And I think we're, so, I'm excited to see the new facility and, of course, the new, the new farm coming online with yeah. much more capacity. So. And I'm, uh, I, want, I really want to thank Willem and uh, Marcus for making this thing uh, happen. This is great. I mean, just uh, keep doing what you're doing. We'll all learn from one another. I think that's the only way to grow. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, perfect. Thank you all. And thanks for everybody for attending. Um, next week, we will have a, a session on kind of coffee at home and subscription services with folks from um, Trade Coffee and Stand Art. Pardon my typo there on the slide. I think that was an autocorrect. But um, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your, your story and your family's history. And it's so good to connect. It's been some time since we've been together. Aman, um, always inspiring what you've built and what you continue to build by looking forward. So thanks Thank everybody. You. There's some really beautiful comments in the chat window as well. I'm um, giving you yeah. accolades. So we'll, we'll have this archived at, um, on Facebook and also at coffeecampus.com slash blog. Thanks everybody. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.